Good morning, folks. Happy Monday. Uh, it's been a while since I've uploaded one of these, <laughs> about a month at this point. So uh, if you have been patiently waiting for another addition to the playlist here, uh, you have my apologies. <laughs> I've been uh, training for a new job, and it's taken up quite a bit of my time. But anyway, uh, you know, I think this problem is a very common type of problem that uh, we'll eventually run into in other chapters using strategies involving work and energy. And uh, it's good to see how to solve this the hard way using um, our current techniques before we jump into the shortcuts. So let's tackle this maximum height of an object connected by a chord problem and see how it works. So we have a very simple problem description, pretty short. Uh, there's just two objects with masses 5 kilograms and 2 kilograms hanging 0 0.6 meters above the floor from two ends of a cord. The cord is 6 meters long and it passes over this frictionless pulley, so we don't have to worry about any kind of weird stuff there. We're told that both objects start from rest and our job is to find the maximum height reached by this two kilogram object and to give you a little bit of a visualization and some clarity before we start with free body diagrams and stuff let's all agree on um, a reference uh, I'm going to call the floor uh, y is equal to zero that's gonna make things a little bit easier and uh, to give you a sense of what's gonna happen when we release these from rest the blocks are gonna do something like this, right? We expect the heavier one to drop to the ground and the lighter one is going to rise to some y maximum value that we need to calculate. And that is pretty much it. Um, there is uh, a little bit of a, a, a portion of the problem that is meant to trick you a little bit as we move forward, but there's no prep work needed uh, before we go into the free body diagrams. So let's start with that first, specifically, the free body diagram of the heavier block. So, um, before labeling forces, let's remember to include a proper coordinate axes, which I'll insert off to the left to save some space. Uh, with that done, we are free to superimpose the same axes right on the center of our heavier block, and now we can start putting forces on there. Um, when the block falls to the ground, it doesn't move sideways at all. So that's kind of an indication that all the forces that we're going to put on this uh, label here, uh, it's going to be entirely vertically. So let's begin with the easiest force, the one that I typically start with. That would be the weight of the heavier block. And so as you can see here, since the block is more massive uh, than the other one, we need to draw our weight vector uh, pretty long to reflect that. In the opposite direction, we have the tension of the cord pulling upwards. However, the tension isn't strong enough to fully resist the weight. You know, this heavier block is going to fall to the ground. So let's indicate this by drawing a smaller tension vector. And uh, these are the only two forces acting on the heavier block, but let's not forget to label a downwards acceleration vector off to the side. That kind of indicates to our reader that the block is definitely going to fall. For the lighter block, we have something of the opposite situation occurring. You know, we start with the axes, nothing different there, but this time, the weight of the lighter block is the shorter vector and the tension is the longer one and this is going to result in a positive acceleration for the lighter block as we would expect based on uh, the picture from the problem description and um, you know with that included that is everything accounted for we are free to move on to sum of forces and um, we'll jump back into the heavier block and start off with our vector equation for f equals ma at the top where the mass is now specifically referencing the mass of the heavier block and like we've done in many other problems we're gonna break this vector equation 
up into horizontal and vertical chunks. <laughs> As for the horizontal, we already talked about how nothing is happening there. There are no sideways forces. The block is just going to fall directly downward. So we can just slap a zero right in there and forget about it. Doesn't matter. Uh, in the vertical, however, we do have forces acting. This one is not going to be zero. As mentioned before, uh, we have our tension acting upwards in the positive y direction and the weight of the heavier block acting downwards in the negative y. So that's reflected over on the left-hand side here. And since our acceleration vector points in the negative y direction, we have minus ma on the right hand side. Very important distinction, don't forget that. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a clue as to what's going to happen in the next couple slides. Uh, we need a positive MA because we're going to do a little bit of uh, algebra to get rid of some stuff we don't need. So let's do ourselves a favor and multiply both sides of this expression by negative 1. So that will rearrange the heavy weight of the block to be positive and the tension negative. And MA on the right-hand side is now positive, like we're going to need. Um, there's nothing else that we can really do here, at least with just this expression. So let's underline this and come back to it later. It's going to be important. Uh, as for the lighter block, the process is pretty similar. Okay, we start with the vector equation, f equals ma at the top. The mass specifically references the lighter block this time. And like with the heavier block, there are no forces acting in the horizontal. So again, slap a zero on there, forget about it. We don't care. In the vertical, um, we have uh, the same forces, but instead it's the tension that's positive now and the weight that's negative and our acceleration vector points in the plus y direction, so we have a positive ma on the right-hand side, which means we don't have to do any kind of uh, adjustments, like multiplying by negative 1 on both sides or anything. Uh, however, um, again, th there's nowhere else we can really go here, so let's underline this expression as well. And it might seem like we're stuck, but let's grab those two underlined expressions. And the idea of how to move forward in this problem kind of goes like this. We're going to take both sides uh, on the left-hand side of these two expressions and add them together. And we're going to take uh, both sides of the right-hand side of these expressions and add those together. And here's what that's going to look like. Okay, I've taken you know, the top left one, put it in parentheses, and the bottom right, left hand one, and also put it in parentheses, and we're adding them together, uh, together on the same side, excuse me. And the same goes for MA. You know, both MAs end up on the right side. And um, at this point, we don't really need parentheses anymore, so we can just go ahead and get rid of them. And uh, as you can tell from the title slide here, uh, we want to solve for the acceleration. So uh, here's what our next simplification step will look like. As you can see, we have a negative t being added with a positive t, uh, the tension. So that will end up going away. And on the right-hand side, I have factored out the acceleration. And our next step will look like this. No more tension. Um, we want to solve for the acceleration, so that means we'll divide both sides by the sum of the masses located inside these parentheses, which will look like this. Now, we weren't given the weights of the blocks. We were given the masses. So here we know what the denominator would be, but the numerator is still a mystery. However, we can... Um, use the definition of weight to our advantage and exchange w for mg. Uh, since we know what g is and we know what the masses are, that puts us in a really good spot. Okay? The, uh, the next step will look like this, and we can start plugging in the numbers that we were provided in the problem description. So in the numerator, we're just taking the difference of those masses, and in the denominator, we're adding them together, and the whole thing gets multiplied by g. 
So ultimately, the acceleration experienced by both blocks is just three-sevenths of g. The heavier block uh, has this value but negative, and the lighter block has this value but positive. And uh, this is not our final answer, um, so don't get too confused. The idea is that we're going to use this acceleration value to get to where we, we need to go. So our next step is to figure out how long it took the heavy block to fall and hit the ground. And you may ask why. Um, since the blocks are connected by a cord, we expect the lighter block to rise for at least the same amount of time that the heavier block falls for. And if we want to figure out how long the heavier block falls for, we can get that by using our vertical position equation that we've seen in other kinematics problems and stuff like that. And uh, we're free to uh, plug in some of the information that was provided in the problem description, uh, as I've done in the next step here. The final position for the heavier block is at the ground, so it's going to be at y is equal to zero. The initial height for the heavier block, or blo both blocks, rather, no, excuse me, is 0 0.6 meters. Both blocks started from rest, so there's no initial velocity to account for. That's just zero. And here I'm plugging in our acceleration, but I'm changing this positive to a negative because, like I said in the previous slide, the heavier block has this 3 7th g acceleration, but it's downward. So that's being accounted for here. And the idea is now we're going to do a little bit of algebra and try to solve for the time. And that's pretty easy. Here in this step, we can multiply both sides by 2 and then divide both sides by the uh, expression for our acceleration. And with that, we're free to take the square root of both sides. Just be sure to plug in 9.8 meters per second squared for g, like this. And your calculator should say something similar to this, right? So the heavier block fell for just over half a second. And um, this is great. Um, now we can use this to solve for how high the lighter block rose for during the heavier block's fall time. And if we go on to the next slide, you'll kind of see this process here. We're going to use the exact same position equation. And now we're applying this to the lighter block. And we don't know what the final height of the lighter block will be, so we leave that alone. That's what we want. The lighter block started at 0 0.6 meters, and so that's the initial height there. Again, uh, the block was released from rest, so there's no initial velocity in the y direction. That turns to 0. And I've plugged in the same expression for the acceleration, but I left the positive because for the lighter block, the acceleration is in the positive direction. And here is the time that the other block has fallen for. And so by plugging in all of this information, we should be able to figure out how high the lighter block rose during this time period. And you should get, essentially, exactly 1.2 meters. Um, however, here is where the problem is trying to trip you up. The lighter block can continue to rise even if the heavier one stops falling. And you might ask, you know, why? How is that the case? Well, when the lighter block reaches this 1.2 meter height, it will have a non-zero speed. And it can't just instantly go from a non-zero speed to zero speed. It has to move a certain distance in order to slow down. So the idea is that we need to take this 1.2 meters and then add that to the extra distance that the block rises to uh, in the process of slowing down. And, and once we add them together, that's what y max is. And that might be a little bit confusing, so let's um, jump into uh, solving for the lighter block's speed.
as it rises uh, to that first 1.2 meter position. Here's the expression that we're going to use. Uh, we want the final velocity. Uh, thankfully, we don't have an initial velocity, so we can just throw that piece away in the next step. And we have everything else here. We know the acceleration, and we know what delta y is. That's the change in the height as it rises. So if it starts at 0 0.6 meters and it rises to 1.2, well, 1.2 meters minus 0 0.6 is 0 0.6. So if we start entering in this information into our expression and we take the square root of both sides and plug in those values, we should be able to solve for what the lighter block's velocity is once it hits 1.2 meters up. And in fact, indeed, it's non-zero. This is 2.245 meters per second. So remember, um, the block is going to have to cover some additional vertical distance to bring this down to zero. So let's use another expression to figure out what that distance might be in the process of slowing down. Uh, thankfully, it's the same exact expression, but I've included some subscripts uh, where it says top to separate this from the previous expression that we had. Okay, we're not going to use the same numbers. Um, this time, the initial velocity is the 2.245 meters per second, and the final velocity at the very top of y max is going to be zero. And now what we want to do is solve for delta y subscript top. That's going to tell us the extra small distance needed that we have to add to 1.2 meters to get y max. So if we just kind of swing this portion over to the other side, we can do a little bit of algebra and divide both sides by 2g and plug this into our calculator. And I get this value. Okay, It's a very small distance, but it definitely needs to be included. Otherwise, we're going to end up with the wrong answer. So, therefore, like I've mentioned a couple times, y max is going to be the sum of the 1.2 meters that the lighter block rose during the heavier block falling, plus the extra vertical distance that the lighter block rises to in the process of slowing down. And so if we add these two together, that's what this looks like, and you should get a value similar to this. Now, uh, unfortunately, we have too many significant figures here, so we'll have to truncate to the proper amount provided in the problem description, and I believe that was three. So if we cut this appropriately, we get approximately equal to 1.46 meters, and that is the value of y max. That is how high the lighter block is going to rise to in the process of releasing these from rest. That is our answer. Thanks for watching. Take care, everyone.